So, in first place, uh, could you introduce yourself in a few words, like uh, your name, your occupation, and what are you doing here? Okay, so my name is Michel Bowens. Um, I'm from Belgium originally, but I live in uh, Northern Thailand. And I'm here for six months to work for the Flock Society project, which is a transition research. So it's about imagining Ecuador as a society where knowledge is freely shared, so that you have uh, a commons of knowledge, uh, open education, open science, uh, open technical knowledge, so that not only the companies with a lot of money can with patents can use the, the knowledge but actually everyone all companies all citizens uh, can use and build on common knowledge and thereby you know promote a, a more rapid uh, sharing of innovation and, and, and science and technology mm -hmm. um, how are you how are you and your team getting that so yeah, the project of how is helping to achieve this goal? Yes, so we have a team of uh, seven people and five research streams. So what we are, the way that we think about this transformation to a social knowledge economy is that it can be done just by looking at knowledge, but it has to look at the conditions that make knowledge flow. So first of all, you need human capabilities. Not everybody is able to use technology and to know how to deal with knowledge, so we have to, to train people and how do we do this. Uh, the second is called productive matrix. So for example, we are uh, researching how technology can be shared by uh, small farmers and indigenous communities, which may not have easy access to technology. And for example, the industry is not making machines for small farmers, so maybe we can have an open agricultural machine in commons where the engineers from the whole world can design machines but then they can be made locally by uh, farmers in a micro factory for example. Uh, the third is called institutional innovation. If you want to share knowledge we need a new type of licenses like creative commons licensing. Um, the fourth one is called open technical infrastructures. That's really about the internet itself so what kind of internet do we need? that is open and free so that everyone can use it and information can effectively flow. And the fifth one is called Commons for Collective Life. So this is about energy provisioning, it's about housing, transportation, food, because nothing, in the, you know, nothing is just matter and nothing is just ideas. There's always a combination, right? Um, so for example, if you want uh, housing for everyone, and there's a lot of new techniques that can protect housing from market speculation. But you also need to know that there's maybe 40% of houses empty in the city. That's the average in Europe. I don't know about Ecuador yet, right? So where are these houses? Uh, why are they empty? So this, this is the knowledge aspect, right? Mm -hmm. And which are the advantages of uh, uh, getting to a new society as well as having the common and free circulation of knowledge? Well, the, the basic uh, problem for countries like Ecuador is that despite you know, having a progressive government and, and social policies, that it's still dependent, it's still in a neo-colonial dependency. So the basic issue is that you're exporting raw material with very uh, limited uh, added value. So there's not much profit in it, but you have to import uh, machines and uh, processed uh, material which are very high value added and so uh, that creates an imbalance where Ecuador is always kind of behind, right? And we know from a lot of research that patents, for example, are not good for um, scientific innovation. You, you, when, you have, when you have patents in a particular field that take renewable energy, you have a 20-year delay in innovation. Uh, this happened in the United States in California in the 1970s. We had a thriving uh, renewable energy industry in the 70s. The big oil companies bought the patents, shelved it in a drawer, and nothing happened for 30 years. Another example is 3D printing, which is um, a new type of machines that you can, um, you know, like a printer, but you can print objects, right? And so this ha holds a lot of promise for a new form of manufacturing, which is much more closer to the people, closer to the lo local people. Um, now, everybody is talking about 3D printing. The reason is that the patent died. 
uh, for 30 years, nobody ever heard about 3D printing. It was a niche product for you know, very small industries. Now that 3D printing is open, there are people in the whole world and the innovation uh, in 3D printing is just amazing. So this kind of rapid innovation could help a country like Ecuador, you know, like bootstrap it, uh, jumpstart, you know, the, the economic um, uh, evolution of Ecuador. So this is what we, we're working on, changing the productive matrix. Um, agriculture, industry, services, education. And yes. I would like to know why are you doing this research team here in the UN and here in Ecuador? Okay, well, you know, we are mostly foreigners here and we're invited by Ecuador, so... <laughs> uh, but the reason it's a historic uh, project is that... So, you know, we call this the peer-to-peer -peer economy um, because it's actually based on the fact that today people can much more easily organize themselves over the networks and create value together, right? And, and create very complex things like Wikipedia, open source cars, peer-to-peer -peer satellites, which wasn't possible, say, 20 years ago. Um, now, this is done with, by many, many local communities, so it's a grassroots movement, and it's slowly going up the scale. So we have sharing cities like San Francisco and Seoul. We have sharing regions like uh, Bordeaux. But what we didn't have until now is a sharing country. And so it's the first time in history that a nation state uh, actually says we want to go in that direction. So in this sense, this is a really historic project. Um, so we never had the legitimacy, you know, the, the kind of stamp that, yes, this is a serious thing. We're going to research it and make policies uh, about this uh, transformation. Mm -hmm. But uh, does Ecuador have any, any kind of characteristics that maybe for this kind of project or whatever, um, like an um, Well, I, I, okay, Ecuador is, you know, not of the most advanced country in this type of dynamic, but it has a peculiar government, which is very concerned about uh, inclusion and fighting poverty and uh, has succeeded in, in improving quite significantly the living standards in a very short period of time. Uh, and, you know, it's a new government, so they're open-minded, right? So I think it's more like a political opportunity. Um, you know, the old way, the old socialist way isn't really working anymore and capitalism is in crisis, so people are looking for a third or a different alternative. And so this is why uh, countries like Ecuador, I think, and the government are looking for new ways of thinking about, you know, human progress and, and social progress. Um, yeah, I think it's really, um, you know, now I, the IAEN, I, I think it's also because it's a new institution. I mean, the IAEN is an old institution, but it used to be a military university, right? So the fact that, that it was transformed into a civic institution for public officials um, is like a new start. And when you start anew, you're always more flexible and looking for alternatives. It's a, so it's a combination of these three things, a, a worldwide grassroots movement showing that there is something new happening in society, a progressive government and a, a kind of institution that's taking a new start. And those three things came somehow together, um, you know, to create a flock project. Okay, because which is the play, uh, the play that the uh, IAEN <laughs> has to play in the society? You know? Uh, well, as the way I understand it, it's, um, it's a special university for public servants. Um, and so it's to train uh, public servants in uh, you know, new knowledge, part participatory processes, uh, more inclusive process of decision making. Um, and um, so I think it, it really, it's a good fit. Uh, I mean, we are really happy here. Um, we get uh, a lot of support and uh, we were very free in uh, getting people from abroad. And I think that's also quite unique. Uh, you know, we are in a sensitive position. We are foreigners, right? So we, we invite it. And we're not telling people what to do. Uh, but we're making proposals, right? But the fact that um, the government and the leadership of um, 
IAN is open to having people like us come here, I think is shows an open mind, right? It, it, they're not afraid to ask people from outside for advice and 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 uh, you know proposals. Yeah, do you think it's like a two-way road that? that also the institution and the, the work that you are doing here among the others is, is pushing to get the society more yes. advanced and the society is like reclaiming also yes. this new so, incomings. So, you know, within the project what we are doing is we're looking at scientific input both locally and globally and we're looking for civic input meaning, you know, grassroots organizations but also different ministers and, and uh, we all also wrote an open letter to the commoners of the world for uh, input into you know, our project. So we're doing both international, global, but also uh, we're working with local people. Uh, we organized 24 local workshops, one in every province, uh, where you know we kind of basically explain the social knowledge economy principle, but through uh, through art, to theater. And then we solicit uh, input from women and young people and, and civic organizations. And so we take that into account. We also work with local activist organizations. We work with ASLI, which is the Association for Free Software. We work with the Abluma, which is an urban uh, activist group here in Quito. So we work with eight different groups that you know, represent the change agents within uh, Ecuador. What is your wish to achieve here, you know? What is the idealistic goal of the flow project yes. that you would like to get for Okay, so we, we're working towards uh, a, a temporary goal, which is a, a big conference at the end of May, where President Correa will be here, uh, several ministers, lawyers, constitutionalists, uh, also experts, both from abroad and Ecuador, and then also uh, civic organizations. And so we will present 10 different frameworks for lawmaking and policy making in what we want to achieve. Now, we are in a sensitive position. We are foreigners. Well, we, we can't get involved in a local fight, right? We, this is not our job. We just have to propose a really good transition program and legal framework. And what is our hope? Well, that it will be taken into account. <laughs> uh, so, well, to actually um, enable a much more democratic society where uh, civil society can be much more creative, innovative, uh, you know, is enabled and facilitated to create these new types of commons. So, so the idea is, Im imagine Ecuador and you have an open education commons, an open science commons, an open civic commons. So if you want open education, you need material conditions. You need uh, maybe open source scientific labs. But you also need open textbooks and open courseware, right? immaterial things. If you want open civic commons, you need open government data. Right? So that's what we're doing. We are, we are researching how to achieve this, this goal of a social knowledge economy and making proposals so that the government can help the people to become more autonomous, more able to cooperate, less dependent on, on state institutions, uh, maybe more independent of commercial pressure. Uh, okay. uh, you would like to add anything else? No, no, just that I'm happy to be here and uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a great opportunity.